Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this presentation of On the Hill, Flowers, Fruit, and Festivals, The Hauser Story. Joining us today to share this story are two members of the Hauser family, one by birth, Becky Carnahan, and one by marriage, Ellen Hauser. They're just two of the many folks who have brought this presentation together. So I'd like to thank Becky and Ellen, along with other members of the Hauser family, as well as our sponsor, Apostle Island's Historic Preservation Conservancy, Tony Jeanette of T. Joseph Media, and all the other Bayfield Heritage Association volunteers who've worked to make this event happen. This presentation is being recorded and the recording will be available on our website and social media pages, along with many past presentations. If you enjoy this presentation today, I invite you to dig into those archives and to join us for our next presentation in the John Matthew Black Lecture Series on November 13th, when Bob Mackrath shares the fascinating story of an early Madeline Island pioneer and her transformation from proper Eastern lady to bold adventurer. Just a note, during the presentation, your cameras and microphones will be turned off to minimize disruptions. Um, please use the chat function to share your comments and ask questions, which Becky, Ellen, and Fritz Hauser will address during the question and answer session immediately following this talk. And with that, I'll turn it over to Becky and Ellen to start the show. Hi, I'm Ellen Hauser. Uh, my husband is Jim, or no, best known as Fritz Hauser. And I'm Becky Carnahan, formerly known Hauser. I am Fritz's sister. We're here to share with you On the Hill, Flowers, Fruits, and Festivals, which we call the Hauser Story. In 1937, the Duluth Tribune article shown here depicts several industries of Bayfield. By 1937, the farming industry was going strong. There were 25 to 30 producing farms in the area at that time. Some grew produce that went to the cannery. Some specialized in small fruits that were shipped by rail to the cities. One of those farms was our farm, the Hauser's Superior View Farm. As the article states, the home of the largest perennial farm in Minnesota and Wisconsin, more than 300 varieties of perennials grown with between one to three million plants sold annually. Who were the Hausers? How'd they get here? Why Bayfield? What was their contribution to the area? This is the start of the Hauser story. The Hausers have actually been in Wisconsin for seven generations when the first Hauser immigrated from Switzerland to Campbell, Wisconsin, which is near La Crosse. In Bayfield, five generations of Hausers have lived here. Generation one, John F. Hauser, came in 1908 and began farming. Generation two, John Dawson, expanded on perennials, bringing in new varieties, and offering a mail order service. Generation three, Jim Sr. and his wife Marilyn, expanded their greenhouses to support their perennial business and started a red shed plant sale. They also added Marilyn's homemade jams and jellies. Generation four, Jim Jr., or known as Fritz and Ellen, expanded the red shed sale, expanded the store, built several new greenhouses, and built a new building that houses an office cidery and a new jam kitchen. And now it's in generation five, Dane and Emma take their turn. We'll expand more on all these generations in a later part of the presentation. Hi, this is Becky. I'll talk about John F. Hauser. He is my great grandfather. He was born July 30, 1869. Indeed, it has been said on the day of his birth, July 30, 1869, the sun went into a total eclipse. The planet's graceful tribute upon the arrival of one who was to attain such distinction and win such a warm spot in the affections of fellow citizens. And so, as tens of thousands of chrysanthemums burst into bloom these days, the press pays tribute to the man whom it can truly be said flowers grow where he walks. When he who plants flowers serves his fellow man, he who speaks the language of flowers can converse with any man. Uh, this source, by the way, was from John F. Hauser's tribute at the day of his death. John F. Hauser spent his youth as a market gardener in La Crosse before becoming trial grounds operator for the Salzer Seed Company. He was later promoted to the manager of the flower and vegetable seed department. This is where he met Carl and how the flowers came to Bayfield. Carl, you ask? Who's Carl? Well, Carl Wallenweeder offered John a job 
in a small town of northern Wisconsin to manage his fruit farm, which at one point had over 100 employees. John F. Hauser and family, wife Lydia and young son John Dawson, arrived in Bayfield May of 1908. What was little understood at the time was the unique microclimate in Bayfield. John, an experienced grower, quickly came to realize that that big, beautiful Lake Superior and facing hillside made the area a grower's dream. That big, deep lake helps moderate the temperatures. In the spring, because the lake is so cold, the spring season here is just a bit later, thus protecting the bloom of the fruit trees and the berries from frost, as well as extending the season in the late fall with the now warm lake waters that help protect the produce from that early killing frost. It also brings lots of lake effect snow in the winter, which insulates and protects the perennial plants in the ground. There was a huge demand for fresh produce in the cities. John F. bought his own property adjacent to the Ball and Weeder farm from Art Figgy Sr. He moved his family from town to a small shack on that property. The first year they cleared the land of pine, they hauled horse manure to improve the soil for the strawberries. By year three, they were growing over 25 acres of berries and were shipping two rail cars a day. He bought his second property in 1911, and in 1912, all was good until it wasn't. The strawberry market flooded. It was the beginning of the end for the berries. All was not lost for Hauser, though. Their small farm still grew berries, sold locally, lots of garden vegetables, and 17 acres of potatoes they were still able to get by. John, an avid horticulturist, read that with the onset of World War I, there would be an embargo of perennial plants from Europe. He saw this as an opportunity and quickly purchased enough seed to plant one half acre of perennials. He said that experiment gained him $1,500. That's a lot of money in that time. With that business, with careful tending and planning, eventually became one of the main income sources for the family. John F. Hauser proved to be a talented grower. In the early years, he traveled by train to many of the nearby states, some not so nearby, to show his expertise in the potato cultivation. The picture on the left is a reprint of a 1914 Bayfield County article that mentions John F.'s work on small fruit growing. The photo on the right is a picture of a 1915 Nebraska State Fair produce winner. John F. Hauser is pictured on the lower left. In 1929, he was honored by the Wisconsin Horticulture Society as one of the top three farmers in the state. Described as a pioneer horticulturist in northern Wisconsin who discovered the adaptability of that section for propagation of herbaceous perennials. In other words, that earlier mentioned microclimate was great for perennial plants. In 1944, John F. was honored by the UW-Wisconsin Agriculture Department as one of five outstanding farmers in the state. His recognition cited his work as a specialist who gave unstinted help in the Victory Garden program of 1943. The citation went on to say he also served as a neighborhood leader in Bayfield for many years. When the 4-H club started in 1916, he organized the first group in his community. He was also recognized for being especially active in the promotion of seed quality, cow testing association work, and the development of small fruit, i.e. strawberries and cherries, orchards and the home gardens. In 1962, he was also awarded the prestigious Golden Apple Award by the Wisconsin and Minnesota Horticulture Societies. John Dawson, known to all as Just Dawson, Dawson was just four years old when his family moved from La Crosse, Wisconsin to Bayfield to work for Carl Volenweeder. Dawson followed closely in his father's footsteps. He too would travel with the family to the various state fairs and festivals, showing his own expertise in growing potatoes. The above photos and articles depict young Dawson with his prize-winning potatoes. Anyone who had met Dawson would say he loved to tell a good story. Here's a few of these stories told by Dawson. Dawson recalled a neighbor, the man from Chicago, bought land in Bayfield on the hill. He, however, did not understand the harsh reality of winter in the Northland. He decided to stay the winter. He wasn't used to the narrow, snowy roads. Thus, according to Hauser, spent most of the winter being hauled out of ditches and snowbanks. The following spring, 
The Hausers bought his land too, the A.K. Morris Fairview Farm. In the early 30s, the perennial market was slowing. At the same time, the apple business was heating up. In 1935, a portion of the original William Knight Orchard came up to sale. It was an opportunity that Dawson just had to take the risk. According to Dawson, the property was for sale by the bank for $2,000. He only needed $1 to secure that loan. While with the banker, Dawson opened his slim wallet to finalize that payment. The banker got a look in his very slim wallet and told him, you just keep the dollar, you might need it. With that purchase, Dawson fully invested in the orchard business. Another story I like to tell is how the farm got its current name. There were three partners in the original farm, which was called the Fairview Orchard. Hauser bought out the other two partners and Dawson, in his dry, sense of humor fashion, said it was named Superior View Farm because the view was not fair. It was superior. The first and second generations of Hausers were key contributors in early horticulture for the northern climes. Both John Dawson and John F. served on the board of the Wisconsin Horticultural Society. Dawson was also elected by the area farmers to chair the Bayfield chapter and assist the county ASC committee in administering programs such as grain feed bases, agricultural conservation, and cost sharing measures. He also served as the director of the Bayfield Growers Association. Dawson and his wife Opal were also active members of the Rebecca's and Oddfellows Lodge and the Bayfield Chamber of Commerce. They did some traveling to the various state and world fairs and farm conventions. In 1948, this postcard addressed to Jimmy Hauser, also known as Jim Sr., was written by mom, Opal Hauser. Dear kids, we are now at St. Louis taking in the convention. We have not seen, and unfortunately I can't read the name, yet, Mr. and Mrs. Connell, apple growers from downstate that patented the Connell red apple that are still growing on Hauser Farm today, are here. Tell Grandpa John, F, that Carl Vollenwaiter and his son Fred are here too. You be good. The photos on the top right are John the third and Jimmy, Jim Sr. On the bottom are Jimmy and his sisters. Nancy's on the left, Jimmy in the middle with Sally on the right. Chrysanthemums, Dawson's claim to fame. Hauser planted acres of mums and loved showing them off. Throughout the summer season, many of the local businesses benefited from the byproduct, the blossoms of the perennial plants. You see, the plants themselves were the marketable product. The blooms were considered waste. So Dawson would cut fresh flowers and several times a week would deliver them to the local businesses downtown for display. Kind of great marketing on his part. People would ask, where did the beautiful flowers come from? And of course, they'd be told Hauser's Superior View Farm. This is a 1953 photo taken at the farm, three generations of the Hausers amid the mums. The 55 photo on the left shows Superior View Farm headlines to the local news. 15,000 bushels of apples and 200,000 perennials. Whether it be perennial time or apple season, the whole family worked the farm till the mid 60s. John III left the farm to run his own farm. Bill ventured out on his own to become a heavy equipment operator. Jim Sr. stayed with his first love, the farm. Marilyn, Jim's wife, tried to get him to go on long vacations. She said a week was his max because after about day three, he'd get super antsy and wanted to return home to go check on things. That has not changed. Apples and flowers. Both were the mainstay income for the Hauser family. Over the years, the Hausers diversified and changed with the industry. This allowed them to grow and prosper. By the mid 80s, the farm owned and operated by Jim Sr. Like his forefathers saw times were changing and he also needed to make decisions in order to continue profitability. Jim and Marilyn started the Red Shed plant sale. This was the official start of the sale of perennial plants on site as they're mostly a mail order operation. This was totally unique and it was a hit. Bringing people in from the tri-state area to purchase bare root perennials, the red shed pictured above was the original site for the sale. This building was built in 1928 as a packing house. 
built by Olaf Selfworth. There used to be a large sliding garage door. The inside had a deep sloping floor that allowed you to back a big truck into the shed. And because of that slope, it made the truck bed fairly level with the back floor, the farmer's version of a loading dock. This building was ideal for the bare root perennials. No windows and the concrete floors kept things nice and cool. For the sale, perennials were dug, put bare root into boxes, and the boxes layered the sides of the ramps. Customers could come in and select a variety of single perennial plants. This is a huge success for the local perennial business, as mail order had a minimum of 12 plants of any one kind or color, which for the casual gardener was way too many plants. This allowed them to select a much smaller quantity and gave them more variety. As the local market grew, so did the need for space. The plant sale moved to the Sears and Roebuck kit barn that was built in 1928. This barn arrived by rail car and then was hauled to the farm site by horse and wagon. It was originally used as a milk barn, cows in the lower area with hay above. Marilyn also began her jams and jellies business. She worked a full-time job off-site and made and bottled her products nights and weekends. The photo above is how the barn looks today. In order to keep up with the perennial demand, Jim Sr. soon realized he needed a new addition, a greenhouse. The original greenhouse used to be attached to the main house, which during Dawson's time was replaced with a kitchen addition. Photo on the left shows Jim standing by that original greenhouse. A shed style greenhouse was added to the back of the garage. This worked well for the perennials until they outgrew that greenhouse. In 1999, they once again outgrew the greenhouse and built a 35 by 100 foot hoop style greenhouse. And a few years later, in 2004, they added another. This perennial business takes a lot of space. These greenhouses served the farm until a harsh winter snow brought them both down in 2019 and 2020. Hauser's expanding greenhouse. Wait, what? Again? In 2016, with Dane's interest in greenhouse growing and an opportunity like his forefathers just couldn't pass up, the farm purchased two 150 by 30 foot greenhouses from Bill Bailey on Whiting Road. This added a wholesale annual flower operation to the farm. The above is a photo, wives included, in the newest greenhouse additions. Dane, family, and a few friends reassembled the two greenhouses and built connecting, planting, and soil buildings to house this new business. Which brings us to apple season. Becky talked a lot about perennials, but not enough about apples. Early on, the farm's income was totally dependent upon the perennial plant sales in the spring, and then they did apple sales in the fall. On the slide, you'll see 1956 newspaper clippings. Upper left, Lydia, Joan, and Barb, who are John Hauser's children. Below, Sherry and Lori, who are Jim Sr.'s children. And the top right is a 1988 news article with Dane Hauser on the tractor. Pretty sure he's not driving, but pulling a load of apple baskets full of apples. As you can see, big or small, everyone joins the fun. These photos also show that here's Sherry all grown up now and Becky, who's with us here today, both still work at the farm today. And then on the right, Corey, who is Jim Sr.'s child on a 1977 parade float. We all help in apple season. Big or small, there's always a job for you. Family members and a lot of honorary housers come and help at apple season. Fresh apple cider. Who doesn't love fresh apple cider this time of year? Jim Sr. used to partner with a neighbor and friends, Bob and Perry Shuga at Hillcrest Orchard to make fresh apple cider. Bob owned the cider press and they both, Bob and Jim Sr., provided apples and then Jim provided the labor. And it's a good thing Jim had a lot of kids. They would bottle well into the night, pressing and bottling several hundred gallons at a time. As you can see in the photos on top, there's the fresh cider running on the upper right there. And on the bottom was the crushing process way back in the day. And then if you look to the left, this is a little bit of the new equipment that we have now for our new press. All the apple pressing was done mostly nights as weekends and weekdays were for picking, grading, and selling apples. 
Fun times for all involved. And they really do have good memories of this. So now that we've talked about both flowers and fruits, let's talk a little bit about festivals. From early recollections, the Apple Festival has been a long-standing fall festival. On the slide, you can see a small excerpt taken from an article written about Superior View Farm. The reporter asked Dawson Hauser what he could recall about the Apple Festival origins. His quick answer, it depends on who you talk to. His long answer, well, seems to me there's a story here to tell. Quote, he recalled a 1940 Apple Festival parade. The Rebecca's selling apple pie by the slice and street vendors selling their wares. By 1945, this festival was going well. Unquote. So which is it? 1940? 1945? 1962? The chamber members in 1962 were Chamber of Commerce President Julian Nelson and directors George Mitchell, Dawson Hauser, Mel Sandstrom, Dan Brummer, Jim Erickson, and Chuck Norwell. And they decided to hold it the first weekend in October and advertise an event and call it, quote, Apple Festival, unquote. So maybe the answer is yes to all, and just a bit more, as Dawson put it. Depends on who you ask. The reality is, this is a story with several beginnings. Another early reference that we found is from a book called People and Places, A Human History of the Apostle Islands by Jane C. Bush, which was published in 2008. The excerpt shown describes the area's fruit and vegetable production in the 20s and 30s. In 1921, it says Bayfield opened the Bayfield Canning Company and that they processed a variety of vegetables and lesser quality apples. Unfortunately, the agricultural boom did not last, but it does state that, quote, in an effort to boost the fruit market, Bayfield held an apple festival in 1926 and instituted an annual strawberry festival in 1931. While the purpose of these festivals was to promote and sell fruit, they also show a growing orientation towards tourism. Local sales and tourism. Bayfield held the first Apple Festival in 1926 and the first Strawberry Festival in 1931. Then of course, we also found these headlines of the week. Thursday, September 22nd, 1955, Bayfield County Press. Chamber of Commerce sponsors Apple Festival. Youngsters will need knee pads and overalls. Another, apple growers throw weight behind Bayfield Apple Festival scheduled for next weekend. Read the headlines. Quote, the Bayfield Chamber of Commerce voted last Thursday evening to sponsor an apple festival for the first weekend in October, with an emphasis on such features as a farmer's market, a parade by apple growers with their trucks, trailers, sprayers, etc., plus games and contests with cash prizes for the winners, unquote. They also said, quote, the event will be worked out in connection with the Parent Teachers Association's annual Fall Festival, scheduled for Saturday, October 1st, with the Apple Festival activities taking place on Sunday. Prize money has been contributed for the winners of the Apple Baking Contest. The pies go to the PTA to be sold. Contest will be arranged, including such projects as pushing an apple for a block along the pavement, using the nose as your pusher, it will be advantageous to have knee pads and overalls for use in that contest." Unquote. It also talked about Dawson Hauser and Walter Barningham planning events of special interest to orchardists. Climax of the celebration? A parade at 2.30 p.m. Sunday, led by the Bayfield High School Band. Some things don't change. So this picture, I think, shows it the way it really is for all of us who live here in Bayfield and up on the orchard and up on the hills. It's another story of change and adaptation. The festivals, just like the farms. Much like the Hauser farm, the city and area farmers needed to change with the times, get creative in their marketing. In the early 1900s, the farmers needed to sell their produce and a parade was a perfect way to advertise it. In 1921, a national depressed fruit and vegetable market required the city founders to think outside the box and start to promote tourism and bring paying customers to town. This 1968 Hauser Superior View Farm float sums it up perfectly. We like it here and we want to stay. Here you can see a 2005 depiction of what we call the Bayfield Fruit Loop. 
Although I will say that there are some people who don't really like that terminology about the fruit loop, but it was really based upon the fact that you can drive along the roads and kind of go in a circle and wind around, and that's where it came to be known as the Bayfield Fruit Loop. As mentioned earlier, the area was perfect for growing fruits and vegetables. Dawson recalled at the beginning, if you remember, 25 to 30 farms in those earlier days. And we show this picture to show that the number has steadily declined since that time. Some have closed, others have opened, and today there are two that have continued with continuous family ownership, the Hausers and the Eriksons. One thing almost everyone had in common was small fruits, which might include strawberries or cherries or blueberries, and apples. This brings us to the last segment of this presentation. This story has been about change and adaptation from 1908 to the present. So what will the future bring for Hausers? One thing is a new cidery. It's called Apple House Cidery, or Apple House Cidery, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Apple is the German word for apple, and Haus, H-A-U-S, is the German word for house. So Apple House Cidery was born. Since the farm pressed its own fresh cider each fall, Dane and his sister Becca thought that a natural evolution would be to ferment the farm's own hard cider. It was important to them that this product be completely farm grown and produced. It's grown, picked, pressed, fermented, and packaged right on the farm. The theme of Apple House Cidery is from blossom to bottle, made right, right here. Expansion of this hard cider business is currently being assisted by a USDA Rural Development Value Added Producers Grant. In addition, Dane is working in partnership with the University of Wisconsin Extension to research and breed hazelnuts that will grow successfully in the upper Midwest. Not sure if you know it, but right now the majority of the world's hazelnuts, think Nutella, are growing in the country of Turkey. So the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Initiative is hopefully going to help make the Midwest a premier grower of hazelnuts as well. The one thing we believe at Hausers is honoring the past. If you take a look at these photos, over in the upper left is kind of an undated photo of John F. Hauser. And then if you go down to the next black and white one right to the right there, there's a four generation photo that was taken in 1965. In the very back, the tallest one in the back there is Jim Sr. And then right next to him on, it would be his right, your left, would be Jim Jr. or Fritz. Seated is John F. Hauser. And to his left is Willie Hauser, who's the son of Bill Hauser. And to his right is Scott Hauser, the son of Jim Sr. Up on the top there, you'll see the Jims. There's Jim Sr. and Jim Jr. Jim Sr. and Jim Jr. both working at the farm today. And then to the right, Becca and Dane Hauser, both the founders of Apple House Cidery. And then on the bottom, the current three generations working daily at the farm, Dane, Jim Sr., and Fritz. So yes, we honor the past, but we also look to the future. Here's some photos on the upper left. That's the building that's replacing the old red shed. The bottom is an operations and cidery and pressing area, and the top is going to hopefully be a tap room someday soon in the future. If you look right below that, we've implemented solar power on top of our greenhouse buildings. And then to the right, this is what the newer Apple Press looks like. There's an elevator that takes the apples up, goes into the press, and uh, pneumatically presses the apples into juice. One never knows what will come next. Becky, I'll let you finish it off. Oh, well, that's easy. The end. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, I'd like to welcome anyone who wants to jump in with any comments or questions that you may have for Becky, Ellen, and Fritz during the uh, Q&A session now. And um, I, I can get us started, though. One thing I was really struck by, and you came back to this and highlighted it towards the end, but just that theme of adaptability and innovation was there throughout. I mean, from the very beginning, it's clearly been such an important part of the success of all the different facets of your farm. Um, and I'm just wondering if you think there's something about 
your family, you know, each family has sort of a culture, what it is that allows you to be so flexible like that and yet still carry those traditions forward? How do you strike that balance? Well, wow, what a question. We were pointing fingers at each other, determining who was going to have to answer that one, but I'll take a stab. Um, just like any other business, it's adaptability. You have to take and follow the trends and move with, you know, where that trend needle might go. Um, things that had happened and, and were done in the past, great grandpa would say something to the effect of, well, you know, that's not the way we did it. Or Grandpa Dawson, wow, that's not exactly what we've done before. But as you adapt, you have to change. You have to make those decisions to fit the model with what is going on today, not what has happened in the past. And then start basing those decisions maybe on what might be happening in the future. Were there any... Um... And you might have touched on this a little bit, but were there any any new innovations or new ideas that you tried out and then had to back up and say, okay, that one's not going to fly? Um, not not too many, I don't think. There there might have been a few minor ones, but nothing nothing major. It might have been a, a process that we changed or plants that sometimes we might have tried that didn't work out very well. But nothing, I don't think there's anything that was catastrophic, put it that way. But, Oh, it wouldn't seem so based on how well everything seems to be going up there. When you were talking about the change from Fairview to Superior View, which is adorable, um, I noticed it also said Sand River Road. Is that what County Highway J used to be called at one point? Yes, that was, that's what that was called. Correct. What is there a Sand River around? Uh, yeah, Sand River is about... Um, probably 10 miles north of Bayfield on Highway 13. Oh, okay. And that was the way to get there at the time. They went around the back way. You had to go, otherwise if you went through like Red Cliff, you go, there's a bunch of little ravines and things you couldn't get there along the lake. So that they used, the, it was called the Sand River Road at that time. Okay, that's interesting, thank you. So Rick shared a comment, and I'll just read it in case anyone isn't seeing the chat. Um, nice presentation. According to my father, my grandfather, Emilin on Alaska, Wisconsin, had an agreement with the brothers who co-owned his farm to pay them their fair share. So grandpa kept the farm, and then John F. used the money to buy the start of the farm in Bayfield. Not sure how the other brothers used the money. Interesting. Yeah, that would that would date back to um, at the beginning of the timeline where we said they've been in Wisconsin for seven generations. So that's what um, he is referencing is that um, uh, those first two generations before um, John F. moved to Bayfield. So thank you. Great. Any any favorite memories you want to share from your experiences there at Superior View Farm? The best memories for us as a family always um, heads to the sales, right? The plant sale in the spring, and quite frankly, the Apple Fest in the fall. That's a huge family event, and it is to this day. You know, I, my early memories as a young child, um, riding on the uh, apple wagon, so they have to go down and, and pick up the bushels of apples. You saw that little picture of Dane with the, with the wagon behind kind of the same tractor and probably the same wagon that was used when we were kids. The whole family worked the, the festival. And so mom and dad had a lot of kids. She, there was eight of us running around at one time or another. Uh, the younger kids had to be somewhere. So they parked us up on those wagons. We'd ride on the apples or they'd you know, leave a bushel out. And you'd sit down in your little hole. Um, some got to ride in the truck, but everybody was involved in it brings back tons of memories of just being and, and working together as a family to pull that off because it is a lot of work. Yeah. Well, even today, yeah, all of our all of our kids, our grandkids, family friends, uh, college friends. This is a, we on average have what fifty to sixty people here over Apple Fest helping out. Um, those aren't paid jobs. I'll have you know. 
but they come up because it's become such a family tradition. And we kind of have a, uh, saying once it's your job, it's always your job. It really doesn't matter if you're related by blood. If it's your job, it's your job. You better be here. <laughs> well, it seems like working together like that has kept everyone really close. It sure has. It sure has. And we all get along for the most part, I guess. So, I mean, that's a big part of why the farm continues today is our family, uh, I say, does get along. I mean, we do. I mean, I mean, uh, look at how I close I sit to him. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to, um, I'm, I'm relatively new to the family because Fritz and I have only been married for 25 years. But one of the things that really struck me is that um, I think one of the principles underneath everything that they don't even think about is they really love to share the farm with everybody, not just family, but also everyone else. Um, there's nothing that makes a Hauser happier than seeing friends, customers, anybody up smiling and enjoying um, the view or the orchards or just the farm. And so that's that's really something that kind of underpins everything. Um, that barn has been the place of celebration of many, many, many Hauser Christmases. They would have to like turn some heat on and, and we would go out there. Um, actually, Fritz and I had our wedding reception there um, mm -hmm. the summer after we got married in the main floor of the barn and had a dance and singer. Mm -hmm. Um, Dane and Emma got married in our greenhouses and had their reception here, there just last, um, last December. So, um, and, you know, Apple Festival, when we get so many people up here, um, as hard of work as it is, it really just makes us happy to be able to share, share with everyone. Well, thank everybody for joining us today. And let's all thank Becky, Ellen, and Fritz, and our sponsor, Apostle Islands Historic Preservation Conservancy. Can I say one last thing? Absolutely. Um, this, this is Ellen. And I just really, really, you know, Bob Nelson brought this concept to me originally about trying to do a history of the Hauser family. And, and um, as exciting as it was, I wasn't really quite sure where to start. And at the same time, um, Becky had taken on the task of taking all the Hauser scrapbooks um, and some of the things that came from Jim Sr.'s siblings and things like that and cataloging them and um, putting, scanning them into a computer and things like that. So she was willing to step in and put this presentation together. And so I just have to thank Bob and especially Becky. Um, and then, of course, Tony who guided us through this. We've never done this before. This is our first presentation. We've been a part of at BHA. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of those people for, for all the help. Well, thank you so much. And we will see you next time. Bye.